Um, I'll start on the left-hand side. I've noted three questions. One, two, three. Okay, you can start there. All right, my name is uh, Joseph Tufour from Ghana. Uh, my, my first question uh, uh, goes to uh, Yannick uh, on the uh, energy issues. Uh, you give the German experience and then that of France, uh, which uh, seems to be uh, fine for Germany in terms of how uh, the individuals are able to collaborate and then uh, set up, for example, a, a wind uh, turbine to generate electricity. H how easy is the German experience, for example, uh, being able to be uh, applied in a developing country, uh, given the context of the institutions, the markets that should be existed for such an arrangement uh, to be made possible uh, in a developing country context? Uh, it's nice hearing the part of uh, uh, in Guyan, the, the Vietnamese uh, experience in terms of the forest uh, condition where um, you need to protect the forest and all that. You talked about the fact that there's a shift from uh, agri to industry and then at a the point I noticed that there were so many issues raised about the environmental pollution and all that. Why was the neglect of the, of the policy and the implementation as there was a shift from agri to industry. It looks as if um, after the move, initially when it showed the, the rate of uh, contribution from agri and industry, there's a move, gradual move to, to industry, or industry is contributing much to uh, development. Why was that neglect of taking into the consideration the fact that as you industrialize, you are likely to pollute the environment more. For example, polythene, bass, rubber, takes a long time to, to degenerate and all that. Why was that neglect? The second point is that once you have forests, people may be living in the forest or close to it, and there's a temptation for them to, to depend on the forest, maybe uh, firewood, charcoal in the forest setting. In this case, how has that been, been managed in terms of the communities that are living in the forest or close to the forest and they are dependent on the forest resources? Okay. Thank you. Um, Hong from CIM. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, uh, on, no, yeah, two questions. Uh, two other comments. <laughs> First, uh, the two questions I would like to ask uh, the Yannick presentation on uh, the kind of the financing institutions uh, in uh, uh, France, in Germany. Uh, you uh, described very uh, uh, rightly uh, that uh, there, there, there should be some kind of the right incentives to give uh, um, to uh, the, 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 the projects particularly green projects uh, to be uh, um, particularly with the investor uh, to be able to invest in green projects. Um, my question is, uh, is uh, what kind of the incentives policies the governments of uh, France and uh, German, uh, Germany uh, provide uh, the investors in uh, promoting uh, the green projects uh, in those three, uh, two countries. Uh, and um, the second uh, questions is uh, how can you ensure uh, that the, the investor could be willing to come up to your kind of the, the facility, the fund uh, to borrow or to ask for the grant because uh, uh, from our experience sometimes the investor disencourage to go to such kind of facilities because uh, the, uh, their opportunity costs uh, are very high. Uh, my uh, sec, uh, my comments uh, to uh, Nguyen uh, the Tang's uh, presentation is uh, I think that uh, um, in addition to the uh, the institutional uh, reforms that you just uh, described, uh, I, I think very important uh, one of uh, a very important reform recently uh, Vietnam uh, has introduced. Uh, is a kind of the environmental protection fund, um, which is uh, the, uh, the the kind of the tool to provide the the the, the 
incentives uh, to the projects uh, to invest in the uh, in uh, IND on uh, environmental protection uh, and also to promote uh, the kind of the uh, uh, environmental uh, projects and also uh, I, I think that you sh uh, it could be very interesting you could elaborate the more in kind of the uh, the one percent of the environmental protection uh, expenditure from the budget uh, that's very important, but I, I, I don't think maybe other countries uh, uh, we have such kind of the institution uh, or, or the regulation uh, providing 1% one, uh, 1 of the uh, public expenditure to environmental protections. My last comment is uh, to uh, Channing. Uh, I, I think that uh, I, I uh, learned very much from your presentation and your uh, kind of the, the exercise uh, on, on the impact uh, of the climate change uh, emission and also the, impact, uh, the the requirement of the investment uh, to the green uh, options um, in energy sectors development. Uh, our country is very much uh, also similar to, to, to the case you apply to the Africa. Uh, so that's why my suggestion that maybe uh, uh, you could come to CIM and uh, to make a kind of the joint research and to do the same methodology to analyze uh, how uh, the Vietnam can go with the green uh, path uh, and analyze the impact of the kind of uh, the options. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wisdom Akbalu. Uh, I work with the UNU wider And my question goes to the second presenter, uh, Nguyen. Uh, the first question is about uh, the environmental police. I'll be very happy if you can throw some light on that because uh, one very uh, critical challenge that we face in, uh, in Africa, I mean, Sub-Saharan Africa, and specifically Ghana, is about compliance with uh, uh, environmental regulations. Uh, for example, in fisheries, uh, we have laws that define the minimum mesh size that fishermen are supposed to use. But you will find out that in most communities, a very large percentage of fishermen don't obey these laws. We also have fishing, fishermen using uh, uh, light attraction equipment so they can attract the fish when the moon is out. So compliance is a big problem. So I would like to know uh, how successful, what, what the role of this police is, and how successful they have been in trying to uh, ensure that uh, uh, people comply with, with, with regulations. Uh, the second question is about uh, the payment for forest environmental uh, services. Uh, as, you, as you indicated, only about 45% of this proceed generated uh, uh, goes to uh, the communities. First of all, I would like to know how this uh, uh, value is determined, uh, what determines the pricing of these services, and whether uh, the, the opportunity cost to communities who live around the forest for not cutting down the forest is actually uh, compensated by the 45% that they receive. And if not, uh, what incentive do they have to comply with, uh, with uh, uh, the regulation of not destroying uh, the forest. Uh, you also mentioned that uh, one of the, the policies is about reducing the use of natural capital. Uh, what, 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 what do you mean exactly by reducing the use of natural capital? Do you mean following an optimal path of extraction uh, of this capital, or you just simply uh, reduce the use? What is the economic uh, reasons for this? Thank you very much. and then we'll return for questions. Oh, just, it's the gentleman in front, the one next to you, yes. And then we'll return for another round. Thank you, I have three questions. Uh, one for Yannick uh, about uh, uh, the problem of uh, guarantees, uh, which has been a nightmare for energy efficiency and renewables. And uh, even in um, emerging economies like Brazil, where the National Development Bank is quite capitalized, there's a lot of credit lines that remain idle. And uh, 
with no uh, businessman interested in investing, and the problem of requirement of physical guarantees is always uh, uh, mentioned. There have been some attempts cr to create a guarantee funds and things of the sort, but this is a real problem. You mentioned renewables, wind projects, but in energy efficiency, it's still worse uh, for trying to foster ESCOs, energy service companies, has not been as uh, good uh, success. So on the contrary, even when the financial community comes, they get into ESCOs and actually reproduce a conservative behavior again. So the ESCOs uh, divert from their original purpose. So it's been quite uh, tough. And uh, I wonder if after all the, after all the Jeff market transportation uh, transformation strategy, and uh, by that time there were standard contracts that were trying to be uh, designed, what is the latest status of this? <laughs> of the art in that kind, how can we overcome these difficulties? On the Vietnamese case for Tang, uh, my question is about uh, the environmental policy tools, uh, environment impact assessment, and the strategic environment assessment. What's your experience? Uh, how many studies? Who is doing that? What's the cost? And particularly, is it mandatory for strategic environment assessment as well, or just for environment impact statement? And what kind of projects, some examples uh, of the experience, if uh, the conclusions, the recommendations are being taken into account in the decision-making process? That means if they are done ex ante prior to the decision or just after the decision was already made about investment when they have no uh, conditions to influence the decision-making process. And uh, a second question to you would be about uh, the payment for service, for environmental service. The, I understand that 45% of the money has been flown to the communities. And uh, what is this money being used for? Are there plans uh, how the destination of this payment uh, uh, this uh, income is being used by c the communities if there is an evaluation of the performance and the uh, improvement in regional development or, or conservation, environmental conservation in the region. And the third question for Channing is about uh, this carbon tax being regressive in South Africa. Uh, and uh, my question is if you have already uh, uh, made an experiment with uh, different uh, ways of recycling the carbon uh, tax income. Um, for instance, probably if you reduce uh, social charge on employment generation instead of reducing indirect taxes uh, to make the, the carbon tax neutral, probably this would improve the, the, the social impact of the tax. So if you have got already results on that, I would be curious to learn. Thank you. Okay, I think the panelists can respond. It seems that we will follow the same order than the presentations. The uh, first, uh, regarding the relevance of the German model for developing country, I haven't used the terminology German model. I don't think it would be rele relevant to any country right now but Germany. And uh, because one of my points is that if you take the German model and you try to apply it to France, where the differences are minute, because of these minute differences, you end up with a totally different result. So you can imagine trying to use this model for a developing country where you, you do not have any of the basic institutional preconditions needed. It's simply not to work. And uh, so the German model is not a model for France and even less a model for uh, developing countries. But what is interesting is to, sh to see that uh, in each country, 
you can actually come with a very specific financial ecosystem for a task at end. What the lesson from the German model is the importance of the coherence and the consistency in your approach. You must have a very coherent institutional and policy framework. In a developing country, for example, I wouldn't go for cooperative right now because simply for even a question of income, the average investment in Germany is about 3,200 euros per person. So uh, more than $4,000. So you are, definitely speaking, you are definitely speaking about a different level of money. But in a, in a developing country, you could, for example, rely on the local government. And rather than the cooperative, you bring the government, uh, the local government in the middle, and you try to provide access to uh, domestic, to long-term affordable domestic finance to local uh, government through a number of different uh, policy and financial uh, measures. It's uh, actually in each country, it could be interesting to prepare the same uh, financial uh, landscape that I did, you know, the general one. So for example, for Vietnam, what are the different institutions? What are the different sources of finance that these institutions can capture right now? What are the different type of instrument? And in function of what you want to achieve, what kind of uh, institutional coalitions you will need to create. The, uh, but I will think first local government and second ESCOs, rural energy uh, service company, and I will come back to that one. The, uh, regarding the issue of incentives, what kind of incentives is being provided by the German and the French government to individual citizens? That's the same incentives. Huh? It's a fading tariff. What is a fading tariff? It's basically you provide a guarantee price over a period of 20 years, let's say. In Germany and France, it's 20 years. And so if you are an investor, if you have a guarantee price for a long term, uh, a long -term period, you can use basic uh, investment appraisal tools to calculate what, what is to be your return. It's very, very simple financial mathematics. So people can very easily understand if it makes sense for them or not to go for it. I personally am a, am a very strong proponent of uh, failing tariff. I would be very surprised if Channing was one, because there is a real Atlantic divide between the US and, uh, and Europe in terms of mechanism. But fading tariff, it's only one mechanism. The International Energy Agency lists more than 4,000 different clean energy uh, instruments, policy instruments. And so a key challenge for uh, decision makers is to identify the right set of instruments in function of their objective and in function of their national financial uh, infrastructure. The, there is no model. Basically, you, the, uh, there are tools that have to be configured to meet the unique requirement of each country. And uh, often, uh, uh, when you try to understand why something did work in a country, you realize that uh, it's not so much because you came up with that policy, but because that policy removed another policy which was bad. So uh, the, 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 the root causes of, uh, of a success are often quite interesting to investigate. But in general, whenever you deal with, when you have, whenever you are in the business of policy making, one should keep in mind that the most likely impact of any policy is the opposite impact of the one you were looking for. And it's f it's a fairly solid rule. The how to make uh, how to incentivize investors to to go for a fund. Investors normally, if you give them money uh, with attractive terms, they will come. But so unfortunately, having money is not enough. If you, if the, the management, the quality of the management of your fund is extraordinarily important. And if, for example, in order for me as an investor to get one dollar from your fund, I have to spend 50 cents in transaction cost, it's not worth my time. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite amazing uh, the amount of transaction cost that can be associated with some individual funds. And in general, the smaller the fund, the bigger the tendency of the fund manager to micromanage, to give tiny little amount, and therefore the higher the transaction cost. If you want to incentivize investors to come to your fund, keep your management cost as low as possible. 
and uh, basically develop financial products that meet their demand. Managing a fund is a business. You have to meet the needs of your clients. The, uh, uh, regarding, oh, regarding the, uh, the guarantees. Einstein used to say that uh, to every simple, uh, to every uh, uh, complex problem, there is a simple and false answer. And it's exactly that with guarantees. It's uh, very complex to transform a market. And so there is a high tenden uh, tendency to come with a simple answer, guarantees. Banks do not want to lend money, provide a guarantee. But most of the time, the reason why an investment does not see the light of the, uh, of the day is because you have a number of institutional, technical, political, financial barriers. And a guarantee can only remove some of these barriers and not obligatory the most complex barriers. So as a rule, if you have 10 barriers, you might need 10 policies. <laughs> Don't, 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 don't bet on uh, all your hopes on one policy. It's very unlikely to, to work. There is, some, there is a huge body of literature no, on this issue. I would recommend to one uh, recent publication from UNEP on the partial loan guarantees for clean energy, because it's relatively simple, and uh, the statistics are uh, quite compelling. I, I understand that I'm running out of time, so I'm not to address the, the issue of this course. We can maybe have a discussion uh, separately uh, on, the, on that one. And uh, that's it, huh? because I have to... Okay, so we are now running into lunch time. So if you still want more questions, I'll allow the panelists. It's up to you how much longer you want us to go on. But I'll allow the panelists to respond um, for the remaining questions, and maybe I'll take three more questions if you'll allow me. Okay, yeah, <coughs> thank you for your question. <coughs> uh, the first question is about the industrialization in Vietnam, why we choose the industrialization and uh, as its cause of uh, lots of uh, pollution. Uh, well, um, Vietnam accepted uh, renovation uh, policy in 1986, almost uh, 30 years ago, and uh, we were on a kind of uh, agricultural country, and uh, we were, you, you know that, uh, a poor country. So uh, to uh, get our poverty and to reduce the poverty, our um, direction is to uh, push up the industrialization. Um, but uh, the, the uh, uh, economic growth and the industrialization is uh, this based uh, um, on the um, uh, low uh, technology uh, uh, level sectors. And uh, technology uh, in, in our industry are almost uh, uh, outdated. Uh, Backwards and so it caused uh, pollution, and uh, that's why our uh, new um, direction is to try to move to the uh, green, uh, uh, more than green growth and uh, green industry. Uh, second, uh, many of you are interested in the uh, payment for forest environment service. Uh, the the um, the mechanism is that. Um, uh, the government uh, promote the um, voluntary uh, contracting between the buyer and uh, the seller of the service, meaning between the uh, hydropower plants, uh, clean water uh, companies, and the provider of service is the uh, household that protect the the forest in the in the upstream area. But uh, uh, because there is no such kind of uh, voluntary contracting, so um, the government regulate a certain uh, level of payment of fee, as I mentioned in my presentation. And this collected revenue will go through the uh, forest fund, forest protection fund. 
either in the uh, national level or either in the provincial level. And from that fund, uh, the money collected will go directly to the household. So there is only, uh, until now, 45% of this collected around 140 million of US dollar uh, disbursed, meaning paid to the household. That is because um, in the mechanism how to pay to the household uh, protected of the forest is, it depends on the area, how much la forest you, you, you keep, you protect, and the type of forest also. Uh, but uh, in Vietnam, in some in provinces, the inventory of the the, the forest, how much uh, uh, the area, and the type of forest, identification of the type of forest, and also it need also uh, monitoring. Uh, okay, uh, the government gave you the money, but do you protect the forest as required? So the um, uh, monitoring and evaluation also play. Um, mm, make it a uh, um, um, uh, complicated issue. So uh, uh, the fund, the forest protection fund also keeps some 10% um, of this uh, revenue to implement the uh, monitoring, uh, inventory, and uh, management uh, things here between the buyer and the provider of the service. Um, <clears throat> about the environment and police, yes, in Vietnam, um, uh, usually we, we, we used to have, and now we still have, that is uh, environment and inspectors. Environment and inspector goes to the uh, enterprises, to the factories, and uh, inspect the environment, environment and protection of the companies. But it seems it, uh, that is not uh, work well. Uh, pollution continues, uh, and also in our law system, uh, when you come to inspect uh, uh, a company, you need to inform them in advance. So that wise, when the inspector come, then uh, the company almost prepare for the inspection, like uh, they will uh, uh, operate the treatment system or something like that. Win. Uh, reduce the production activity or something like that. But um, when we introduce, we establish the environment and police, this means that uh, they will uh, investigate the cases where there is uh, some kind of like uh, environment and crimes. And they can uh, go into the companies, into the factory, anytime. Uh, that they found out they, they, had, they are a violation of the environment legislation. They do not have to uh, inform in advance. Uh, and uh, through, until now, almost uh, uh, nearly uh, 10 years, the environment police have uh, shown uh, effectiveness of their activities. They have um, found out the, uh, the case of Vedan case, um, Taiwanese companies in Vietnam, in South, right, in Ho Chi Minh, near to Ho Chi Minh City, where they, um, in 14 years, they uh, continuously discharge the untreated wastewater, uh, but they do it uh, intentionally uh, uh, hide under the ground and discharge into the rivers. And in 14 years, they almost killed that rivers. And uh, environment and police uh, play a very important role to find out that and to find out the, 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 the underground tunnel, uh, the pipe of discharging this wastewater. Is, um, uh, after having this kind of environment and police, uh, police I think that uh, enterprises and factories in Vietnam now uh, must uh, have to pay more attention on the, on the environment and protection and uh, especially the waste management. Uh, about the EIA and SCA process, yes, uh, EIA in Vietnam is compulsory. Uh, SCA, the strategic uh, environment assessment, also compulsory for some kind of uh, 
um, st um, strategy, uh, plan, master plan, and uh, plan. And uh, about the SCA, it should be implemented uh, parallelly with the uh, with the uh, development of the strategy or master plan or plan, and it needs to be conducted by. Uh, by the agency that developed uh, the, the the strategy or master plan, um, uh, the SCA will have to be uh, appraised by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, and it is a base, uh, a legal base for approval of the, the the strategy and uh, master plan and plan. And the SEA is tool that uh, try to uh, incorporate, integrate the environmental concerns, environment consideration into the process of uh, development of the strategy, uh, master plan, and plan. Uh, EIA, uh, it is uh, more specific to the investment project. So every investment project prior to getting the investment license, they need to conduct the EIA uh, process and to come up with the EIA report. And in that report, they have to uh, forecast uh, environmental impacts uh, of the project and then uh, propose and uh, provide uh, measures how to deal with this uh, environmental impacts. And to get the license, the investment license, they need to have the EIA report appraised by either by MONRE, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, or by uh, Provincial Department of Natural Resources and Environment. It depends on the level and the scale of the project. It uh, big or it uh, high, uh, it it uh, it uh, small. Oh, well, so I think that is uh, um, uh, and. Uh, Another question about sustainable use of natural resources in Vietnam. Uh, actually, until now, uh, Vietnam uh, economic growth is relying on the uh, natural resources very much. Uh, we export uh, coal, oil, and uh, in the past uh, two decades, so uh, and now. Uh, to get our poverty, we, we, we our economic growth, our economic growth model is based on the natural resources. And now, we're trying to uh, shift to uh, uh, a more sustainable use, exploitation of the natural resources. For example, for mineral, we uh, ban now, uh, the government ban to export the crude uh, minerals without any, um, Processing. Uh, in terms of water, uh, uh, our um, water uh, Vietnam is uh, depending a lot on the outside. Sixty percent of surface water is come from the the, the outside uh, of country. Uh, in in many reason, uh, we lack. We have deficit of uh, water. Uh, uh, by reason, by reason, and also by uh, season. Uh, our production uh, is uh, the intensity of the water use is very high, so we will try to, to reduce uh, the water intensity. And also in, in terms of um, uh, land use, um, uh, we trying to use the land more efficiently. Uh, for example, we have like uh, uh, 70 million uh, piece, pieces of land in agriculture because um, Vietnam is now 90 million, but uh, in uh, our farming is at a small scale, household scale, so we divided uh, the land into small pieces. And, and it is not uh, used uh, efficiently. So our direction now is to try to push up this and uh, to merge the pieces of land and to make it uh, the, the, the farming more at a higher scale. So I think, yeah. uh, Channing, it's up to you. I mean, we now are 13 minutes in deficit. I'm not sure we'll oh, be able to get I, more I, questions. So. OK, yeah, no, I was going to say, um, I can be very quick. Um, uh, regressive tax, absolutely. Uh, 
you know, and perhaps I, sh I should have done that, but uh, it, it's, it's uh, simple to, to do. There are some trade-offs that are involved, uh, but, you know, we just haven't taken the time to, to work through the actual, all the mechanisms. We just put in place something that was, that was simple, and, and, and that's what shows up. Um, I wanted to respond to, to Yannick on, on feed-in tariffs that absolutely, I'm not against feed-in tariffs, and in fact, I just, I just bought some solar panels on the basis of, of uh, feed-in tariffs in, in my hometown on a little, little, little farm. And, and more generally, um, I don't think that uh, we necessarily take anything off of the table in this, in this kind of um, discussion. It's, it's you know, what's important is effective and, and, and efficient, right? We, we cannot have inefficient, and, and we are very often going to be in a second best kind of situation, so we have to look, okay, what, given the situation, is, is, the, is the best way to proceed. We, de we do not want to proceed in inefficient ways because that's going to be going to give us a backlash and, and that'll be a problem. Um, and, and to Hong, we'll uh, see you on Tuesday. Okay, so South Africa's just gone through a renewable energy procurement phase. The way that it worked there was that we had feeded tariffs and then we had guaranteed offtake off agreements from government for 20 years. Um, and the experience there, because we've got fairly deep financial markets, is once the rules were clear and the guarantees were clear, basically it was fairly easy for, um, for renewable energy providers to, um, to find the cash. Okay, anyone else who's eager will find the gentleman, I think, um, after the discussion, if that's okay, so that we can release the people who want to go. Sir, so we'll indulge you, but I think anyone who needs to leave um, can leave the session. If you want to ask your question, you may do so. Uh, first of all, thank you for your very interesting presentation. And uh, to set, I am going to go directly to uh, the question. Um, uh, my question first to go to uh, Yannick uh, was to, uh, how do you balance between the negative tax and positive tax? Uh, I mean, positive tax for fossil fuel and uh, negative tax for uh, renewable energy? Uh, or put differently, uh, what's this, the, the approach or method to identify the right level of uh, feed-in tariff? And uh, the, the second thing, uh, you know, you give the um, uh, example of Germany and uh, as well as the France, and the difference between the two is you would see that uh, uh, I would see that, uh, for example, in France you have only eight copper energy cooperatives, and for in the Fran Germany you have eight hundreds. So what I, uh, I also felt that uh, in your presentation there is a limited. Uh, uh, equity finance from uh, the French government, is it compared to German government, uh, if I, I understand correctly? And uh, so what is the reason behind that, why the French government uh, haven't uh, support that uh, uh, financial instrument? Uh, thank you. Okay, we'll have the last question from the ARC. <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'm um, Samuel Makubo from ARC. I just want to ask Channing the question that uh, if, say, we rely on uh, hydropower, do you think that it is very, very risky? Like in Kenya, you know, about 50% of our energy, I mean, of our power comes from uh, hydropower, and many times we have a lot of, of fluctuations. Do you think it's good to always go for a mix? I'll, I'll, I'll start um, on the uh, on, on the risk issue. Um, there, there's sort of it, depending on the size of the reservoir and so forth, short and long wave um, power power fluctuations. Um, this is a question I, I posed uh, yesterday. Um, we we find that especially on the Congo and in the Nile, um, that that the power outputs uh, are are really remarkably constant. The Congo River Basin is enormous. And so the, the and, uh, you know, the, there's, a, there's a sort of portfolio. Um, we, we've worried even, because 
Uh, we worry a lot about climate change, right? If we're going to invest a lot of money in a, in a big dam and then it stops raining in the, in the Congo River Basin, that would be a, a disappointment. Um, but, but that seems also to be uh, very, very unlikely. So, so it is something uh, to, to worry about. Um, wh what we tend to find is that um, uh, uh, these, that, that mixing hydropower systems with, uh, with other renewable systems can actually give you quite a lot of stability and, and really leverage um, the, the renewable systems in that, you know, the hydropower can kind of serve as a short-term battery because it's relatively easy to, to, to move more water through more tur turbines or less as, as, you, uh, as you're adjusting to either meet demand or, or deal with fluctuations in supply. So, so uh, you know, uh, the evidence at, at this point is that, uh, that yeah, it, it can be done and it, and it can be quite uh, uh, reliable. The, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very impressed by your questions because you clearly paid attention to the presentation because I, I went very, very quickly on purpose through the slide on de-risking instruments because that was the topic of my presentation last year and I did not want to repeat that presentation. But in a nutshell, you have thousands of different policy instruments to reduce risk. But if possible, it's better to treat risk, uh, and notably all the policy-related risk, the uh, administrative risk. It's better to get rid of them because, for example, in France, you need 29 agencies' approval in order to sit your project. If you can come with a one-stop shop where an investor go to only one guichet, you dramatically reduce the risk of delays in the startup of your projects. And this has a financial cost. So as, far as, as much as possible, it's better to treat risk and to treat it through policy measures. If you cannot treat them, you can transfer them and uh, through insurances, guarantees. And you should move toward uh, uh, fiscal instruments, negative or positive fiscal instruments, only as a last recourse. The, uh, because this has normally, when you compensate for risk, it has a high cost. So if you move toward fiscal instruments, it's much better to go f uh, toward uh, uh, basically taxing than giving a subsidy. So it's better to come with a carbon tax than providing uh, a subsidy for something. And it's even better, actually, to remove subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies. So in, in the taxation instruments, first remove your subsidies, after uh, you will remove your subsidies on fossil fuels, after tax uh, fossil fuels, and only after provide subsidies for renewable energy. So you have a gradation, a hierarchy in the different type of instruments. But here again, that's, uh, we have done quite a lot of modeling in terms of cost, notably for South Africa, what kind of policy mix could work for South Africa. And uh, it's, I will need a presentation of 20 minutes to walk you through. But I can give you the, uh, the references uh, in terms of literature on that one, what we have published on this issue. The, uh, your second point regarding uh, uh, the equity in France, it's, it's linked to the regulatory framework for cooperative. You have different type of regulatory framework, but one of them prevent local government from providing more than 20% equity to a project. And the reason is because this, uh, the regulatory framework for cooperative was designed quite a long time ago and not with energy, not with decentralized energy in mind. So it's obsolete. The, it was designed to protect consumers. It was designed to protect the independence of the cooperative, etc. It was designed with other concerns in mind. And therefore, it needs to be uh, updated. The, uh, you will find this for uh, any kind of decentralized renewable energy. Most of our policies, most of our financing instruments have been designed for centralized, large-scale asset financing. As soon as you move toward decentralized asset financing, you end up with a lot of obsolete uh, regulations that need to be updated. Well, um, thank you, presenters. It was great. Um, and thank you to you for the robust discussion. Thank you.